Episode 5, How to Save Enough for Retirement. Are you ready to get charged up about your money, your credit, and your overall financial health? You've come to the right place. You're listening to Charged Up with Jenny Hoff. Welcome to Charged Up. I'm your host, Jenny Hoff. I'm excited today to introduce you to Professor Teresa Gilarducci, an expert in saving for retirement and also extremely down to earth and lucid so that you can actually implement her advice. She was an economics professor at Notre Dame for 25 years. She's authored several books. Her essays and opinion pieces have been published in major news publications, and she speaks at conferences around the country to eager crowds who want to know how they can actually make retirement work if they didn't start saving in their 20s. The advice she has applies to you if you are in your 20s or 30s or 40s and beyond. So let's get charged up about finally mastering retirement planning. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. You talk a lot about in your book about debt and mortgages and how that can really hinder our ability to save for retirement. Can you talk a little bit more about that debt, credit card debt, mortgages, and why we need to get rid of that if we want to start saving for retirement? So I don't know if you have to get rid of mortgage debt or credit card debt or any other kind of debt one is justified taking on in order to save for retirement. It's not axiomatic, but there are some laws of math that everyone needs to know, which is if you um, spend more than you earn, um, and that could be in a week, in a month, you know, in a five-year period, you're going to take on debt. But if you're going to consume while you're retired, you actually have to consume less than you earn. So you can't have debt to save for retirement and consume more than you earn all at the same time. Something has to give. So what we find in this regular human behavior is that people are usually in debt mode and they've begun to justify every debt, every expenditure as an investment. And whenever I hear people talk about their spending as an investment, I start to get worried. And having the habit of debt actually can get people out of the habit of saving. Um, though there is a way to, to balance that. So this is the way I would balance having mortgage debt and paying off your maybe your college debt or your credit card debt and saving for retirement. And that's to change the one thing you can change how much you consume today. You should drive down your debt to zero because you don't want to pay the banks any more money. They've got enough money. They don't need your interest money. It's time we stop subsidizing the banks with our consumption habits. And that goes for mortgage interest as well. If you are starting out and cannot get into decent housing without taking on a, a mortgage, then there are a couple of rules of thumb you should take in order when you're considering a mortgage, which is if you can't put down 20% and pay it off in 15 years, you're buying too much house. So whatever you want to buy, make sure you can pay it off in 15 years with a realistic view of what your income is going to be in the next 15 years. And don't buy until you have 20% down. You'll get a much lower interest rate and you'll pay it off hopefully in fewer years than 15 years, but at least 15 years. And even though you have debt, you should start, one should start a habit of saving for retirement anyway. So this could mean for someone who is buying a house, has debt, and is preparing for the future is to live on a lot less today than they normally would think they want to or need to. But that's what gives. You can't have debt, save for retirement, and consume like you're consuming all at the same time. So you say as far as debt goes, we need to adjust our consumption habits so that we're not spending more than what we're taking in and we're not buying more of a house than what we can really afford. And I think a lot of people feel if I can put 10% down on a house on a 30-year mortgage, I'm good. But you're saying 20% down, 15 years, you should be able to pay it off or you're buying too much house. Yeah, let me be clear. 20% down, 15-year mortgage. We'll get people an asset at the end of those 15 years. The rate of return on housing is often very much exaggerated. The um, increase in the value of your house really often just matches inflation or a little bit less in most areas of the country. And you're usually paying an interest payment that is higher than the ordinary appreciation of your house. And if you're in that situation, that's not an investment. But you can justify losing a little bit on your house because you're paying off a mortgage because it's where you live. But you don't want to pay the 
bank more than the house value is going up for very long. If you have a 20% down, then your credit score doesn't matter. You get the best available interest rate. So your chances that this will be a good investment only increases. Let me talk a little bit about where that magic 30-year mortgage and 10% down or even 5% down came from. That came from laws that were formed to help the bank. In the 1930s, when people could not afford their mortgages because of the Great Depression, the same thing happened in the Great Recession of 2009, government scrambled to save the bank from massive default. And what they did was put in this device called the 30-year mortgage so that they could reset the debt people had over a longer period of time. And the banks didn't have to write down those mortgages as bad loans. So this 30-year mortgage is just an artifice of an emergency action to save the banks. It's not good housing finance. Jobs are getting a lot more uncertain for a lot of people. There's no way anybody can predict what their income is going to be over 30 years. And if you can't do that, you should not have debt over 30 years. So I'm uncomfortable with 15 years. I'm just doing this as a way to to help people move off of that 30-year mortgage. i I had a mortgage that I paid off in eight years, and that was because every time I got any extra bit of money, every time I got a raise, I doubled my mortgage payment because I don't like paying banks. You know, I had an emotional um, aspect to it, but it, for my balance sheet, it also meant that I was getting a higher return for every dollar, every hard earned dollar that I got by by working. And so what about also credit card debt? And you talk a little bit about that in your book as well. But I mean, how you recommend people actually just use debit cards as their credit card, because also credit card debt, you're paying the bank, except it's not a three and a half or four percent interest rate. It's twenty five percent interest rate in some cases. I really think of credit card debt the same way I think about heroin or really nice bourbon. It's an addictive substance that does not add to financial health. Credit card are a device by banks and department stores and Amazon and anybody else to get you to pay to buy more, consume more than than you make. And it really, the credit card marketing tries to tap into your dopamine, your addictive. Dopamine is a, is a brain chemical and it's one that, that actually drives addiction. So the marketing campaign and the device is going right to those receptors. The uh, federal government a number of years back Stop allowing people to use their credit card um, debt as a deduction from their tax returns because they figured there was no social purpose met by a credit card interest. You just made it a good point. Credit card interest just costs so much more. So I think a tip might be for people walk into a store and wanting to buy something on a credit card, first of all, increase the price by another 25% or even double the price if you're going to put it on a credit card because eventually that's how much you know, you're going to spend. My ex-husband had a set of towels that he bought 20 years before we, we were married and he was still paying off the credit card. And I held up a ragged piece of towel and I said, you know, this towel costs you $75. <laughs> All you have is this ragged, pathetic washcloth to speak for it. And it was just a way for me gently to talk about how much compound interest adds up. So if people would just say, look at this thing, it's going to is double the price. And I'm going to give the money, not, not for my pleasure, but for the bank's pleasure. I think it's like putting a lot of pepper on, on a souffle. You know, it just is not that appetizing. Right. And so credit cards obviously can be useful if you can pay off the balance every single month and you can accumulate points, etc. But otherwise, if you're keeping a balance, then you shouldn't be buying those things. Let's talk a little bit about the basics of retirement and what are your top tips on how to get started for their retirement and save enough money? What do we need to know? Well, everybody's situation is different, um, but the rules of thumb is that if you start saving for retirement in your 20s, you can save about 7% of your pay. And if you do that your whole career, you will keep your standard of living with Social Security for the rest of your life. If you start in your 30s, you got to double it, you know, to about 14%. If you start in your 40s, you've got to save 25% of your paycheck. If you start in your 50s, you have to save half. So the earlier, the better. Time is on your side. You know, young people have a lot of things to worry about, but one thing they have is the gift of time. So I've actually covered two of your questions. How much do you need and how much should you save? It's the math gives you this one answer. So it's 
seven, 16, you know, 25, 50, depending upon what decade you start. So that's easy. And the second one that's not so easy is about where to invest it in. Since you don't have the benefit of having access to a diverse, well-managed, professionally managed fund like people in defined benefit plans have, then your best bet is to pay the lowest fees possible in a diversified fund. I don't have any connection with Vanguard, but because that company is not a for-profit company in the usual sense that all the profits go to the account holders, it's the place where you get the best value uh, for your investment dollar. So go to Vanguard and just have a mixture of stock and bonds. They sell only passive low-fee funds. And if they try to sneak in one that's not passive, you just have the index funds. And just assume if you go to use calculators that you'll earn about 3% over inflation. You're not going to earn anything better than that. Don't pay attention to what the stock market is doing. The numbers that you hear on the news are not relevant for your portfolio because they change all the time. So go to Vanguard, open up a, an individual retirement account at Vanguard if you're one of the uh, 50% of the population that doesn't have a retirement plan at work. If you have a retirement plan at work, it's probably a 401k. Um, What you want to do is make sure that your employer offers an index option with your fund. Just make sure your HR director knows that you want it. Your HR director wants it. Everybody wants it. Sometimes they just don't have it because they're kind of lazy. And then invest in your 401k. If you leave work, you might want to roll that into an IRA at your Vanguard or just keep it at work as long as it's well invested. Okay, so a couple of the options here. If you don't have any 401k plan at work, go to Vanguard, which is the lowest cost, essentially index fund, where you're just investing in the whole S&P 500, the lowest fees, Don't pay attention to it. This is a long-term strategy, so don't look at the market every day and decide to take your money out. Leave it in there until the end. And if you do have a 401k, max it out, I'm assuming. Is that what you're suggesting, to max out the 401k? Oh, oh, absolutely. About 5 or 6% of people max it out, and that should be a higher number. Max it out. This is a really good time of the year that that we're talking, Jenny, because at the beginning of the year, and if you max out, your pay is going to go down, but it's going to go down by a less amount than if you started to max out, let's say, in towards September. Because the maximum amount you can take out, it depends upon your income, but it can go all the way up to $12,000. And it's just great to save that way. It's automatic. You don't see it. It's taken out of your paycheck, so you you actually have to adjust your spending, which is the only way you're going to maintain a a good financial future to cut your spending now. So the month of January, February is a really good time to start maxing out. Okay, so max out your 401k. If you are in those 30s, 40s, 50s range, as you mentioned, you might want to max out your 401k and take an extra percentage of your pay and putting it in a Vanguard account, right? Because if you need to be saving 15% or more. Um, you know what? One thing I realized in talking to people is they don't realize paying off your debt is a form of savings. So if you want to take that extra amount that you can't you know, get a tax deduction for because you want to save too much, that's the money that goes to pay off your mortgage. Okay. So pay off your mortgage early, which is in some cases, I think people need to always check with their mortgage plans, but you should be able to pay off your principal more, double the principal every month. Yeah. I think it's illegal to actually penalize people for paying off their debt early. There might have been some bad mortgages that slipped through, but most mortgages, there's no prepayment penalty. All of those tips, I think, make a lot of sense, which I think at the end of the day, when you hear advice, probably the most important part is, does that make sense? sense to me? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah. All right. Let's talk a little bit about somebody who might be living paycheck to paycheck and paying for their kids' colleges or paying for classes and all of these different things. How can they start saving for retirement? Turns out a lot of things that people say are absolutely essential, you can get a lot cheaper. There's a lot of predators out there and colleges, you know, want to sell you something. Um, you know, predators might be too strong, but college prices are way too high. And so this is a hard thing to do to tell parents. And I was in a fortunate situation because I'm a professor and my university helped pay for my kids' college. So I, I'm not saying this lightly. It's really important that you have a conversation with your children that goes something like this. I know you want to go to this school or that school and you think the state school isn't good enough for someone with your academic promise and your ambition, but it really is a good place. You can take the honors program. There are really good professors at your state school and 
financially, frankly, I need to save for my retirement so that I won't depend upon you when you're older. And that's the best thing I could do for your future. So instead of putting myself in hot to pay for your college for your financial future, I'm going to make sure that I never, ever have to come to you for money. And that seems to be a, a way that parents tell the bad news to their child that they, they're on their own for college. And the best thing to do is to go to a state school and you can help your kid out out of your current income, you know, whether that's bringing your lunch to work or whatever. A kid can borrow from college, but you can't borrow for your retirement. That's a long way around to saying that the idea that I have to go into debt because it's college, I, I just reject. There are a lot of really, really good, much, much cheaper options. The saddest thing that we're seeing is a child who uh, never finished college. Their parents went um, into debt to pay for them that they didn't even get a degree from. And then now their social security checks are being garnished for that. So there's just way too much college debt for not good enough reasons. All right, let's talk a little bit about that management of debt and management of debt when it comes to retirement planning. We've talked a little bit about paying off of your mortgage as quickly as possible. So what are things that parents can teach their kids about managing debt? And in a sense, we can also teach ourselves about managing debt as we prepare to save for retirement. So there's two parts of debt. One is about income and the other part is about consumption. I have never seen any evidence that says that um, giving a kid allowance and charging them for for chores is a, a good financial lesson. People are in families and they have to just do work because they're in a family, not because you get paid for it. But what I found, um, and this is actually proven, to really work is the Boy Scouts personal finance um, merit badge counseling requires Boy Scout to keep a budget for six months. And there are gentle ways that the Boy Scout, the Scout is encouraged to work with their family on this budget. Two people who are interested in helping their children and also themselves, my best advice is to set up a way to, um, to set up a budget and then account for that budget. And if a child is involved in helping plan for a family vacation, um, for instance, the family could have a family meeting and discuss how much this vacation is going to cost and how they're going to pay for it. And so that the, um, the family and the parents are involved together in this exciting thing about where they're going to go, what they're going to do and how much they're going to pay for it. Um, the, the parents should be keeping a, a household budget and both members of the parents of the two parent family um, should go over that budget, not with their children, but, but themselves. Your children will see your habits. Um, they'll see that you're not an impulse buyer, that you have a set um, budget for certain necessities, and they'll see you in day to day um, following that. So it's a long way around to say the most important way to instruct yourself is to keep a budget and to account for your spending every month. Okay, so at the end of the day, I guess for all of our debt issues, we need to keep a budget, know how much we're spending, know what we can cut out, know how much we can save so we can actually keep an account of everything that we have coming in and everything we have going out. Can I just say one thing about keeping a budget? It's an underappreciated tool because it's a tool of power. If you keep the budget and you know practically what's going out, what's coming in, then the the power of advertising is a lot less. So you've actually then blunted or resisted the power of all these forces telling you to buy, buy, buy. So that's a good thing. The other thing that's good about the budget is that it eliminates shame, that you feel like you're in control, you know the facts, and nobody can tell you, including me or you, our radio program, that you are spending too much. You may actually not make enough to make ends meet. You know, it could be the fault of you don't have a union, you're working for an employer that pays you the minimum possible, but that gives you power to know that it's not just your fault and, and that you have this cycle of consumption and shame. Facts are power and your budget is the most um, intimate kind of data you need to have. I love that. Facts are power and that's the truth, right? You know what you're doing You and you can also say, okay, my salary isn't cutting it. What can I do to increase my salary? That might be the answer to your problem, not necessarily cutting your own consumption consumption, but increasing your salary. So you talk about knowledge as power. How do we need to think about retirement planning in order to actually do that? And I'll say from personal experience, in my 20s, it's felt so far off and almost ridiculous to be putting money away for retirement that I could be using now to enjoy my life. And so how do we need to get into that mindset where it is a tangible thing, 
even though it's maybe decades into the future? Jenny, I, I think you had exactly the key word and the word was enjoy. It has to be fun. I have seen young people, people in their 20s come to me and said, hey, I'm saving at work and I put in the money I'm saving at work in a retirement calculator. And I know that just a little bit of money that I'm putting away now because I am so young is going to give me peace of mind when I'm older. And that feels great. And so part of what has to happen, a 20-year-old doesn't have to choose between fun or misery. That will never work. Misery will never win. And misery should never win. But it's really fun because I know I'm in control. So let's just talk about a young woman who says, I know that I'm saving for my retirement. I know that I can plan to buy a house. I know that I can stand on my own two feet in a relationship, in a marriage, that I am going to set my own destiny. I'm only saying because women, because marriage has this connotation of sort of security and kind of being bailed out. And saving for your retirement is like an adult thing to do. For men, it actually helps resist all the other things that you're supposed to do as a man, you know, to take care of a wife and children and give them everything they need. It's really important for young men to know that pennies now grow to dollars later because they're young. I think saving is more fun for the young than anybody else because you have to really deny yourself just a small fraction of your consumption because you're going to be saving for such a long period of time. It's really hard to save for retirement when you're 40 and 50 and you have to take a big chunk out of your current consumption. So I think saving for retirement when you're 20 is the most fun time to do. And what if you're in your 30s and 40s? How do you convince yourself to go and do it? I guess it's it's more looming, right? The retirement day is more looming. Yes, 30 is better than 40 and saving in your 40s is better than your 50. And if you're 50, it's better than trying to look for work when you're 70. So um, um, it's always worth if you wait. Always. And I think a lot of people, once they hit their 30s and 40s, they see their own parents in retirement and the issues, financial issues that they confront. And maybe that's a big wake up call. I need to be saving for my retirement. Yeah, exactly. When people look at their parents and see that they're not prepared, I have encountered a lot of odd feelings that people are very uncomfortable with, which is like real anxiety and a little bit of disgust, you know, that they didn't take care of themselves a little bit better. And those are not good feelings and people should not have them about their family. No, increasingly it's becoming true for sons, but a lot of daughters and daughters-in-law are having to forsake their own financial future because they have to take off work or quit work in order to take care of their parents and in-laws. And that just builds up a kind of a bad dynamic and fertilizer for resentment. And that's not good. Absolutely. So what percentage of people do you think save enough for retirement? What factors do we not consider when we calculate how much we're actually going to need? I think only about 10% save enough maybe 10, 15 percent. Most of them are because they're in, in jobs to just make them safe. I think very few people actually calculate how much they have to save and do it with discipline unless they get into an automatic mode of doing that. So this is what I suggest. There are tons of cal- retirement calculators out there. Try to go to one that has an extension of .edu or .org. O-R-G. Because if they have .com, they're going to try to sell you something. <laughs> you know, so go to a site that's not for profit. You know, or go to an Excel spreadsheet if you, you know, if you're numerate. Make sure the assumptions about how much you're going to earn is pretty low. Um, Because if you can just say, oh, I'm going to earn 8%, you get an unrealistic and kind of optimistic view of it. So you have to really, you know, really expect you're going to earn about 3 or 4% on your money. And then you have your savings automatically taken from your paycheck before you see it. So many checking accounts will let you send the check automatically to your to your IRA account. I think that's the only thing that'll work. So before you know your paycheck hits your checking account and then your bank automatically sends it to your IRA. They don't make it terribly easy because it's a cost to the bank, you know, not to you, but work through setting it up either online or with your bank to have that check sent. Um, immediately. Yeah. And you were saying also in your book that another good number to think in your head of how much you'll need is 20 times your income. Is that correct? Yeah. 20 times is pretty exaggerated because that 20 times that means if you're making 50,000, you need a million. You know, it just isn't, it's not going to work. And if people aim for about eight times their last salary when they're about 65. They can combine that with Social Security and kind of maintain. Now, you're not going to have money for long-term care insurance or for travel or anything else. So it's a big range. You know, at 20, you're going to be fine. You can pay for any kind of nursing home, 
you know, you want to. Um, at eight, you're going to kind of maintain and hope you get into a nursing home that's paid for by Medicaid. All right. And what gets you charged up about educating people on how to control their financial destiny into retirement? I am so glad for that question, because when I talk to people about how to control their destiny, I see the shame and hopelessness leave their face. And what I see that replaces it is empowerment. And so if I can help people plan for their financial future, I am actually creating people with less shame and more feeling of self-control and also knowledge of where they have to actually stand with other people to make sure their Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are strong. So that's what jazzes me up is that I eliminate shame and substitute self-empowerment. Fantastic. Very interesting conversation today. Thank you so much, Teresa. Thank you, Jenny. It was a very efficient interview. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Charged Up. Next week, I'll be speaking to an expert on how to thrive in a single income household. So be sure to watch out for that episode. If you liked this podcast, please review it and rate it and subscribe on iTunes. That helps keep us going and helps to know what you want to hear. Also, if you have questions that you want me or the experts to answer on air, send me an email at chargedup at creditcards.com. I'll do my very best to get your questions answered. Meanwhile, get charged up about your financial. Financial future.